dungeons. They're easily one of the most important parts of Realm. From the Pirate Cave to the Lost Halls, each has a unique boss, enemies, and gameplay you won't find anywhere else in the Realm. But how are they created? What's the story behind the Magic Woods or the Nest? In this video, I'll cover the story of how five different Realm of the Mad God dungeons came to be. Did you know that, since DECA took the reins from the game, a vast majority of the dungeons released have been community-made? When people think of a community member from the UGC, User Generated Content Group, it's probably Toasters. He's been involved with three huge dungeons that have been added to the game, the Magic Woods, Lost Halls, and Secluded Thicket. I spoke to him about his involvement in all three. So let's first take a deep dive into the Lost Halls. Toasters served as the original creator, but Kid Force was the head behind the project. While I couldn't get an interview with Kid Force, Toasters has had involvement in just about every single dungeon in this video. Toasters served as a sort of secondary designer, so he has quite a bit of insight on the dungeon. Toasters created the original design document for the Lost Halls all the way back in late 2014. When creating a dungeon, there's surprisingly not really a pitch to DECA. Instead, UGC creators generally create a first draft, such as a design document or alpha version, and run it by them before moving forward too much, just in case there are any major concerns. Usually, pitching is more involved when regarding broader changes or additions, such as the recent implementation of new tiered weapons in Lost Halls, or the recent Tablet of the King's Avatar changes to make room for the Penetrating Blast spell. So the original pitch for the Lost Halls was in the form of a comprehensive Google document. Said document certainly had some interesting things that never came to be. For example, the minimap was originally going to be disabled, and the player count was 25. Both of these ultimately never came to fruition, and Toasters described them as misguided. However, he said, it's nice that Realm of the Mad God has a couple proper raid-like experiences nowadays. I think that's something it was always lacking prior. Development shifted from trying to get players lost and disoriented in the halls to more minute-to-minute -minute challenges, and the minimap being disabled eventually was changed too. Lost Halls hasn't just changed from its original design document either. The dungeon has changed greatly from the original 1.0 version to the state it's in now. The original release of the Lost Halls, in Toaster's words, legitimately left psychological scars on me. It was basically just a gradual feeling of dread that mounted over the day as we realized that it was quickly becoming a disaster. It was apparent after the first few runs, but trips to Reddit and the forums later solidified that. Lost Halls certainly did not launch perfectly. It was right before HP scaling became a thing, the gravel exploit was rampant, and the community opinion of the dungeon was spiraling downwards. But from a creator's perspective, to pour countless hours, loads of work, and many long nights into a project you expect to be the next big hit, and watch it crumble in a matter of hours is soul-crushing to say the least. However, they took players' feedback into account and began to correct many things people disliked about the dungeon. Toasters believes the community was justified in calling out many of the 1.0 issues. After listening to feedback and a lot of hard work, we got the 2.0 version of Lost Halls. Featuring new things such as the Bitcoins or Potatoes or whatever your raid leader calls them present in the Marble Colossus fight. Or the addition of the new Defender boss fight. Additionally, the tea room process was streamlined as well. Toasters is just thankful that, after the brutal initial launch, most players were willing to give it another chance. Arguably just as important as any dungeon is the event in the realm to go along with it. In order to have the Lost Halls dungeon potentially appear, you've got to fight the Lost Sentry. This complex event was actually developed on crunch time. There was only a couple weeks until release, so Toasters and Kid Force had to scramble in order to create this event. There was even a unique idea that they had that was canned, but Toasters was fond of. Unfortunately, he wouldn't share what the idea was, but perhaps we'll see it one day in-game. After working with Kid Force and the team on halls, Toasters began to work on the Magic Woods. The Magic Woods started back in 2015, where the initial idea was created. Now, you're probably thinking the initial idea was the boss or the location, but it was actually the enemy names. The dungeon actually started out around the idea of naming every enemy in the dungeon around the 44 default names, believe it or not. Toasters had to learn XML, the programming language Realm uses for its dungeons and bosses, in order to make this dungeon. And he described this dungeon as an XML playground for him. 
That's why a lot of enemies are one note or use very unusual behaviors. While it's in the Godlands now, the dungeon throughout development did not have a clear difficulty level. What was certain were the potion drops and the rarity. The original plan was to have the dungeon drop only from Ent Ancients, giving people an incentive to help close the realm while also providing a bonus opportunity for leveling players. But that would have made the dungeon way too limited, so Ent Gods were added as a drop location, while Ent Ancients act more as sort of a bonus drop. Thing is, that also meant that its placement had shifted from a Midlands dungeon to a Godlands dungeon. It was too late in development to majorly redesign things, so Toasters just made some balance changes based on public testing feedback, and generally increased the threat level as much as reasonably possible. That's unfortunately why it's kind of a pushover. Balancing untiered items is always precarious, and this dungeon was no change. The idea was to have an orb meant for weaker players, who would benefit more from crowd controlling enemies than damage amplification. Unfortunately, what we initially got on testing was a stasis-only orb with a very long duration, essentially the ultimate troll item. This item was naturally unpopular and got reworked, making it more unique and a white bag drop. Uh, additionally, this dungeon would contain a useful staff as well. Toaster's third dungeon is the Secluded Thicket. It's a boss rush dungeon based on the fan favorite Forbidden Jungle. Everyone has memories from their times as a new player running Forbidden Jungles, earning cracked crystal skulls, and is ultimately just a solid early game dungeon. The concept for an epic variant had great potential, and Toasters worked it into a dungeon featuring three unique bosses based on enemies from the original designs. Boss dungeons only have a boss, or multiple, so they have to be held to a much higher standard of quality. For example, if Malthus was a boss in the court, it wouldn't really go over well. It was this pursuit of quality that led to Toasters creating three bosses, Tez Kokodal, El Dorado and Zalatl. Tez Kokodal is Toaster's favorite boss, largely because it was created around the idea of having minions that react with the boss. The minions work in sync with their master and change states accordingly. On the other hand, El Dorado was on the verge of being canned before the inheritance system you find in the current iteration was introduced. While the three different tribesmen were always a part of the design, how their attacks were inherited by the boss has changed over time. In his own words, the inherited tribesmen attacks initially came from the idol itself. There were no floating masks or anything, but that meant it was very safe to just stand far away, and the shots were too dense when you got close. He had a whole bunch of different attacks that are no longer seen. Setting up the current system was utter hell, but I think it paid off. So essentially, the masks you see around the arena were added to decrease the volume of attacks coming off the boss, and to make the difficulty a little more reasonable. In addition to the inheritance system, El Dorado has attacks similar to Janus, where the ground goes red, and you have to avoid the onslaught of projectiles. Creating this sort of ground-altering attack was quite the process. It's a bit hard to explain without knowing the process of map making. But Toasters made corresponding map files for each change he wanted, then set up a sequence of states that causes them to be placed, then replaced by a neutral version of the arena when the attack is over. However, if you look at El Dorado's arena, you'll see that there are three different versions of the gold tile that all line up to come outward in a sort of circle, as well as gem tiles on the borders of the arena, and the center to match where the masks spawn. Initially, the normal gold was just a single tile with a randomized texture like many other ground tiles in the game. Thing is, whenever a new map gets placed, it refreshes all the tiles, which leads to an awkward shuffling effect where the tiles would constantly be changing for no good reason. You can see this problem in the layer of Draconis, for example. In order to remove this odd tile shuffling effect and make the process seem natural, Toasters had to make each ground sprite its own tile and manually place every single one, then remake the arena many, many times for each of the red zones. The lengthy process worked out well, as El Dorado's arena and red tile effect are both pretty awesome. Are you tired of El Dorado yet? Uh, I've got some more to reveal, so strap down. If you compare Janus and El Dorado's red zone attacks, you'll notice one key difference. Janus' projectiles appear from her sprite, while El Dorado's projectiles appear from the reddish line attack he sends out. The infrastructure to allow for this kind of attack, appearing away from the source, was only recently added. In the past, attacks had to come from their source, which meant if you wanted to have an attack like this, you would need a large number of invisible enemies. With the release of the Parasite Chambers, the engine was given the ability to offset attacks and set an X and Y coordinate for their attack source. The Nightmare Colony was the first monster to use this with its wave attack. The gross things on the wall are just for decoration. 
all these projectiles are technically coming from the boss itself, something that wasn't formerly possible. Same thing is true with the Marble Defender. All those little minions are for show, even the ones in the back corners. This system is also in place for El Dorado's attacks as well. With the release of the Secluded Thicket, many crafty players found a way to avoid the third boss's final rage phase by standing in the damaging water on the screen's edge and out healing. I asked Toasters if he was surprised about these exploits. Surprised might not be the right way to describe it. No dungeon release ever goes off without some kind of hitch. Hell, something as simple as the Magic Woods had a crashing issue. I was hoping public testing would let me account for this sort of thing, but nothing quite matches for having something on production. Sure enough, people have been able to tank it through sheer numbers, which is pretty disheartening since I was quite proud of that phase. Making a fix is simple, but actually getting it onto production isn't. Having DECA push a hotfix isn't as simple as pressing a button. Toasters has contributed a massive amount of content to Realm since the DECA takeover, and I'd like to thank him for not only his contributions, but his time spent on these interviews. Toasters is not the only one creating dungeons for the game, however. I spoke to Mr. Unibro, the creator of The Nest, as well. The Nest was initially drafted right back after the Hive was created. Silex, a DECA employee, asked if anyone would want to work on an epic version of the Hive. Apparently DECA said that there was a demand for an epic variant, which led to a bit of joking from the UGC guys, as nobody ever heard anybody say that. Anyhow, Mr. Unibro picked up the task of creating this dungeon, with the simple goals of it being themed around bees, and a difficulty between a sprite world and shatters. The groundwork for the nest had already naturally been laid out with the Hive, so Seuss created a clone of the Hive for Mr. Unibro to transform into a new epic variant. The first thing completed for the nest was actually the rooms, as there's a dedicated editor for dungeon room generation. However, said dungeon editor is not perfect. I was told how it could only place one object per tile, can't load certain things, among other issues. As a result, map editors have found unique workarounds to get things to work. For example, the Summer Nexus had a large amount of objects registered as enemies, so the editor could recognize them. After they were recognized, they had to be unenemied to give you the Nexus we see every summer. The map editor doesn't understand things that aren't enemies, but are characters. It's kind of hard to explain, but things that are friendly, like animals in the Nexus, the editor has a hard time understanding. Mr. Unibro knew when creating the dungeon he wanted a non-deterministic boss, like Oryx 1. A non-deterministic boss essentially means players are kept on their toes about what phases are coming next, rather than having a linear progression of phases. Similar to the thicket we discussed earlier, Mr. Unibro also wanted enemies that would interact and work together. Naturally, having bees cooperate makes sense, but having that work is a very complicated process. The first instance of the nest with these cooperating enemies was buggy, laggy, and did not work properly. Later, the larger bee enemies you see in the dungeon were added. On screen, you can see examples of this cooperation not working properly. For example, the wrong enemy orbiting the wrong thing or enemies duplicating themselves. Realm of the Mad God servers handle in-game object instructions through XML. This coding language means there isn't things like loops or if statements. Additionally, you can't really get the health or information of other objects like state, etc. The only way you can communicate with other objects is orders. Orders work great when communication is a one-way street, like the Death Mage ordering his skeletons to attack you. Things get messy if your communication goes both ways. When invoking the listening for orders behavior, the enemy locks on to its nearest object eligible to listen to. It only changes this lock if the object dies, and it will refuse to listen to any other orders that potentially want this enemy to listen. This workaround was using a middleman. The bees no longer order the hive for healing, since ordering must be a one-way street. And this street between the hive and the bees is occupied for requesting the bees to go to the hive. When the bee gets low, it spawns an invisible object, which orders the hive to heal any bee in a very short range. Meanwhile, the bee looks to protect the hive at a certain range. So, instead of using the one-way street between the hive and the bee that's already occupied, a new street is made from the bee to the temporary object to the hive. I know this was really complicated, it was for me too, don't worry. But if you want more information about this kind of stuff, Mr. Unibro has created a video about the nest and how it was created, alongside technical aspects. This video will cover orders, behaviors, states, the whole nine yards. Watch this video if you want to make Realm of the Mad God dungeons too. Untiered items in the nest are rather coveted. There's the incredibly unique Hive Master helmet, 
the Queen Stinger, and you can find the Behemoth Quiver from the Overworld event. Mr. Unibro found that the Bone Dagger was an interesting concept, but generally went unused due to its low power. So we got a beefed up version, the Queen's Stinger. Additionally, he felt that it was a bummer that people missed the limited time Ice Quiver. He got permission to make this item a permanent drop from the event. Finally, the Helm was the last one thought up. Controlling minions was a new, unique idea for the game. The last two things to be completed for the nest were the Treasure Room and the Overworld event. If you played Realm during the release of this event, you certainly remember the controversy surrounding it. Players argued the event needed to be optional, and was much harder than other events present in the Realm. The event's purpose is to aggregate players, so that when a portal potentially drops, a group of players is ready to enter. Since this is not quite a solo dungeon, it's imperative that the encounter gathers a large number of players. With the nest, you need to invest a lot of time and effort before you're attacking something that'll be worth your while when it dies. The enemies you need to clear through to get to that part are tough and tedious. And as a result, no one decides they want to go run it because they don't want to do something that's not worth their while. In testing, everybody is dedicated to killing the event, which leads to a disconnect between testers and actual players. When it was put into the game, the event fell apart, unfortunately. Mr. Unibro believes the patch making it not required for closing was definitely necessary, although as a result the encounter aggregates even less players. Therefore, there's never a big group which is ready to take on the dungeon when the portal drops. The last dungeon on our list is the Snedarian Reef, which you can find in the Court of Oryx. The Reef is unique in that it's just the second dungeon in the game to utilize the underwater mechanics, which were previously just in the Ocean Trench. A Trapper, the design of the Snedarian Reef, was approached in August of 2017 to design a dungeon around this boss sprite, and he took the challenge. The reef never changed largely from the first ideas, with the only sweeping changes coming to the minions. Originally, there were way more of them, and they couldn't be killed, even in the rage phase. Due to difficulty and hardware constraints, it was dialed back a bit. The Snedarian Reef sits at, in my opinion, a pretty nice difficulty level, and A Trapper agrees. Throughout the dungeon's development, the difficulty kind of went up and down. At the beginning, it was stupidly easy with the group, due to it being mostly solo tested. But at points of development, it was way too difficult. Currently, A Trapper believes it's in the perfect place, and he thinks he ran it around 70 times to get it in the perfect state it's in right now. The boss in the reef summons a variety of different minions, and the player has to kill the golden jellyfish in order to make the boss vulnerable. A Trapper's favorite part about this dungeon is the gold jellyfish mechanic, specifically with how they get more powerful as the fight goes on, and he's particularly proud of how they can make it difficult to tell the different jellyfish apart in the final gold phase by blinding players. The jellyfish were, at one point, one of the most complicated parts of the dungeon. This was because of how A Trapper got the constantly shifting animations of the jellyfish to work. Basically, the jellyfish switched between four states in a very complicated way so they'd cycle between different sprites. After the dungeon was released, A Trapper mentioned this quirk to Toasters, who asked why A Trapper didn't just use a specific tag to do the same thing, but in a very simple way. The initial system implemented was needlessly complicated, as A Trapper had to add the animated junk to each and every single phase of the boss in the code, when all it actually needed was a small bit of code before the behaviors. The reef contains some truly interesting untiered items and a very desirable skin, the poison and the scepter. The scepter was the first one created, as increasing damage from unkillable minions to deliver a huge blast to the boss worked well with the dungeon. Up next came the poison. When a fox showed A Trapper the sprite, he made a comment that it looked like a jellyfish was inside the bottle, and the two loved the idea. So, A Trapper made it an item that throws a tiny jellyfish minion. It went through a few iterations, one of which you saw in public testing, but ended up doing a high damage, stationary area of effect over a period of time. Additionally, Krathen, who works at DECA, helped get these items functional as well. Now, here's a tidbit of information that I thought was interesting about the sought after Jellyhead Trickster skin. Even A Trapper's not sure if the boss drops it. That was the original intent, but it wasn't introduced into the game for normal players until the first chest event. Now, I'm sure everybody is curious about what dungeon creators get for all this hard work. Well, I have the answer. The lead for the dungeon receives every item associated with said dungeon. So, for example, A Trapper received the Snedarian Rod, Bottled Medusazoan in ink, and the Jellyhead Trickster skin, 50 keys to the dungeon, and the full set of Dungeon Mastermind skins. 
Additional contributors to the dungeon receive 10 keys and one item of their choice, plus the Artist Extraordinaire skin if they worked on art. Similarly, if you worked on an ST set, you receive that as well. Now, the developers may get the items, but what about the players? While the UGC creators may suggest rates, DECA ultimately gets the final say on drop rates. So, no juicy item drop rate leaks here. I'm sorry. So, that was a rather lengthy look at 5 Realm of the Mad God dungeons. The amount of work put into this game from UGC creators is astounding, and I hope this video helps players get a deeper look into how they were created. I'd like to thank Toasters, A Trapper, and Mr. Unibro from the bottom of my heart for making this video possible. I mentioned this earlier, but Mr. Unibro also made, or is making, a more technical, in-depth look at how he coded the nest. If you would like to get a further understanding on the XML coding that Realm uses, watch his video and thank you for watching mine.